This is a remastered replay of one of our most popular episodes. Enjoy. I could introduce you to a hundred designers and they would all tell you nonsense. What you just said is nonsense. A product designer, they are trained to come up with the real solutions and they hate companies where all they're asked to do is put lipstick on a pig is the phrase, right? They hate that. Listen up everyone. Great startups are built with great people and there are great people everywhere in the world. But have you ever thought of all the headaches that hiring a global team can create? Entities, compliance, payroll, equipment, provisioning, and more. You're here to build a great startup, not become a global HR expert. But don't give up on the dream. Our sponsor, Deal, is an all-in-one HR platform specifically built for global teams. All those problems instantly solved. Learn more at deal.com slash TSP. That's D-E-E-L dot com slash TSP for the Startup Podcast. You're listening to The Startup Podcast, a show focused on helping you build, run, and invest in Silicon Valley-style startups. Whether you're an investor, founder, or operator in a startup, you'll gain insights on the principles that power high-growth disruption the way Facebook, Google, and Uber do it. The conversation starts now. Hey, I'm Chris. And I'm Yaniv. And on today's episode, we have a very special guest. He started as an engineer at Hewlett Packard before taking on senior product roles at Netscape Communications and eBay. For years now, he has consulted, advised, and spoken on the topic of product. He is perhaps best known for his two books on product management, Inspired and Empowered. I treat these books as the absolute go-tos for anybody who wants to work in a modern product organization, and I know I'm far from the only one. It's our pleasure to welcome Marty Kagan to the Startup Podcast. Thanks for coming on, Marty. Oh, thanks for inviting me, Yana. Fantastic. So we discussed a bit before coming on what we wanted to talk about. And you mentioned an article that you wrote on your SVPG blog a while ago about solution risk and that the article is called The Biggest Risk. One quote that I thought is a good place to jump off from is you say the vast majority of the teams I meet are not actually solving new problems. And so the issue is really making sure that you have a solution that works well for the market. Could you explain a little bit more about what you mean and what you see there? Yeah, I can. And look, there's so many different opinions out there about startups, about how to do product. And the only thing I'd probably clarify on your introduction was my interest has never been product management. It's always been product teams. So I'm interested in anything that helps product teams create great products. In a startup, there is no product manager. There's founders and they're the product people. And then there's designers, there's engineers, and they work together to solve hard problems for customers. So that's what I'm into. It is true that there's a lot more confusion out there around product managers versus the designers and engineers. So I find myself spending more time talking about product managers, but my interest is really product teams. You know, there's so many different views on startups and the venture capital view. There's the MBA view. There's the entrepreneur view. There's doing innovation inside big company view. There's all these different perspectives out there. My experience when it comes to startups, so many people think that you have to be tackling some problem that's never been solved before. There are a few cases I can think of where that's true, but the vast majority, I'm not exaggerating, 95 plus percent of them, they're just solving an existing problem way better than anybody else solved. So whether you're talking an iPhone or whether you're talking a Nest device or whether you're talking a Peloton or I'm picking hardware there, but it could be Slack, Shopify, Stripe. We could just keep going. None of them are solving new problems. They're all existing problems. Yeah, there's no question that whatever you build, you better be solving somebody's problem. (laughs) That's a given. In my experience, that is not hard. You kind of deserve what you get if you haven't made sure you're solving a real problem. It is so easy to do that. Come on. The hard part is solving it so much better than everyone else that people will switch from what they're using today to what you have. Switch to Shopify, switch to Slack, switch to Stripe, switch to Atlassian. This is what you need to get people to do is switch. And they're switching because your solution meets their needs better than the alternatives. And that's why I try to tell founders, look, you have a limited amount of time. It's usually dictated by how much money you've got, right? How much you've raised in seed money. Now, of course, for a while there, 
those numbers were quite high, which took off a lot of these constraints for a while, but we're back to that. So you have limited amount of runway. You better make sure you save your money to make sure you use it to come up with a solution that's good enough that people can buy. You know, we formally call that product market fit so that you really reach something that can sustain a business or at least get you on another round of fundraising to help you build a sales channel and really get going. So that's what I view as the biggest risk. And I don't know why. I think for some reason, people think it's not fashionable to talk about that. They want to talk about demand. They want to talk about meeting, you know, a new need out there. But I just don't think that's the reality. And I think it artificially constrains. You get a lot of founders that think they have to find something that nobody's ever tackled before. There just aren't that many of those things. And the truth is, even if you find one of those things, it's very expensive to develop a new market. That is normally better left to an Apple, to a Google, to an Amazon, where they have the funds to develop the market. And then you come in with your startup product that meets that need much better. Most of these are old problems that we're solving with new technologies, new cultural norms, and new business models. Society is moving forward and you get to solve old problems in a better way. And to your point, what that really means is hopefully you're delivering a better product than what's come before. And that takes an enormous amount of focus, care, attention, craftsmanship that is often, as you said, it doesn't seem very sexy. It's kind of slow, grindy, thoughtful work. But people would rather come to you and say, we're going to change the whole world. We've got this completely innovative new thing that no one's ever thought of. But actually, more than all of that, oftentimes, even the new technology, the new cultural norm, the new business model has already been figured out in another industry. And actually, there are best practices and patterns that you can just borrow. And if you borrow appropriately, you can actually fast forward to the future pretty quickly as well. So one issue is people thinking they have to solve an all new problem. But another issue is what you were alluding to there, Chris, which is, you know, people think that all they got to do is come up with the idea. Once we have the idea, it's a small matter of programming. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just, oh, well, we'll hire a few engineers out of India. We'll have this built in a few months. We're going to make all this money. And literally, they show me these spreadsheets that are just laughable. And I try to explain to them, product is the difference between an idea and actually a successful business. To go from an idea to a true product, that's where all the work is, not coming up with the idea. Ideas are literally, you know, a dime a dozen. We have lots of ideas. As Steve Jobs puts it, craftsmanship. To go from an idea to a true product, which is what we call product discovery, that's where the work is. And that's where, when I talk to startups, I'm like, that's where you need to spend your money, your time. I also make this very real for them because a lot of times when I meet them, they've already burned through half their money. So they're already starting to stress, right? And I say, look, you spent six months, you've burned through half your funds, you've developed one MVP. And what you learned is that MVP sucks. It's horrible. That's what you've learned. Inevitably, that's what they've learned. And I'm like, you need to set your expectations. Realistically, you're going to have to build about 100 MVPs. If you want to have a chance at solving this problem better enough that you can actually build a business. And if you keep working the way you're working, you're never going to get 100 MVPs. You're lucky if you get two more, right? You're lucky if you get two more. And so what that says is that you need to learn some new skills. The way you're doing these, you know, spending four months on an MVP is not how you build product. I'm actually curious. We've had a number of conversations about the definition of MVP and how people are kind of misunderstanding what an MVP is and how fast they need to get to one and what the scope of one is. But putting that aside for a moment, I'm curious about, let's not use the word MVP. Let's talk about kind of the first thing that you put into market that you expect people to use. I'm curious about your thoughts about when to abandon that and decide, well, let's create a hundred of these versus let's iterate on that and let's find a way to polish, refine, learn, and iterate on the thing we have. Because one of the things I find outside of Silicon Valley is people build an MVP. What they're really doing is they're building their first version of a thing, of a notion, of an idea. And then they kind of get bored with that. And then they build another first version of another thing, a different thing. 
and then another thing. And those are called pivots, right? They pivot. Yeah, they're pivoting all day long. They build rough, scrappy things that of course are not good enough to drive product market fit. They go, well, that didn't work. And look, let's pivot, let's pivot, let's pivot. And so I'd love to learn about how you yeah. think about that. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in there because, yeah, I agree. But the problem is even worse than that. People don't realize they're pivoting. And so, yes, we've discussed it on this show numerous times. I think the concept of an MVP as captured by you and other people in that area is completely valid. But the way it gets used is a complete and profound misunderstanding that causes a huge amount of harm, in, in my view. It's nearly this disease of the so-called MVP, where exactly as Chris points out, People build something crappy and that M and MVP somehow justifies building something crappy, but they don't build it as an experiment or a prototype. They just build a bit of a compromised V1. And then as you both note, it doesn't work. And they're like, oh, okay, now let's build the next thing. It's not even understood that what is happening here is a pivot. It's just like, okay, what's next? And you never return to your so-called MVP and make it anything less than minimum and arguably not viable for the market. So yeah, we'd love to get your thoughts on that a bit more. Yeah, well, like we said, if you notice in Inspired, I don't use the term MVP. I acknowledge it, but I said it's way too confusing. People misunderstand it left and right. And I use the term prototype. People understand prototype much better. And I describe the four kinds of prototypes. Technically, what I would argue is the useful definition of MVP. Every prototype is an MVP, but not the way the way you're talking about it is the way I see far too many startups think about it. And it's really not a prototype at all. It's a half-assed product is what it is. So it's way too much work for a prototype, but not enough work for a good product. So it's in that no man's land of crap. And I don't know if you saw, there was a very good blog article just the other day from First Round Capital. I forget the guy who wrote it, but he used his own term for what we call prototype. He called it minimum viable test. He's emphasizing it's just a test. And you don't want to, in fact, Chris, the way you framed the question right at the beginning was kind of even, that's not how you want to frame it. It's like, when do you do something when, you know, you're already in the market? We can do hundreds of iterations before we even get to the market. So you have to realize using your engineers to code is kind of our last resort when it comes to discovery, because that's the slowest, most expensive way to create a prototype. We do it when we need to, but most of the times we don't need to. Most of the times a designer using Figma can run circles around developers trying to create something much easier done by a designer with a tool like Figma. So this is what you want to teach these startups is, first of all, they have to really understand where the risks are. We haven't really talked about it, but that's what product is all about. And that's what startups are absolutely all about. Do you have enough value? Is it usable? Is it feasible? Is it viable? That's what they're trying to figure out. When the answer to those questions are yes, you've got a good chance at a successful product. And so it's all about those risks. And then they learn the techniques for how we tackle those risks. Most of the time, it's by creating prototypes specifically designed to address those risks. And I'm not exaggerating. We can do 10, 20, 50 iterations in a week. Yeah. So you can imagine how much faster a good product company could make progress towards product market fit than these sort of, you know, typical startup spending four months to put one iteration together. That's product discovery. Inspired talks about that. If you're interested, Teresa Torres's new book called Continuous Discovery Habits talks about that. There's a terrific new book from Tony Fidel called Build that talks about that. I mean, a lot of people talk about how you do this. I've never seen a place do as many of these prototypes in discovery as Apple, but realize Apple's creating devices and the cost of screwing up for a device is much worse than internet services, which is primarily I spend a lot of time with. So, you know, because it's much more downside risk, you spend more time on the discovery itself, prototyping, iterating. I think it's worth taking half a step back so we can take a step forward. At the very beginning, you clarified or corrected and said that you're less interested in product management than in product teams. But I think a lot of where problems start is actually with organizations and with people who don't even really understand what a product team is. And of course, it's very difficult to be a good product manager or to have a good product process if you don't get that the atomic unit, that the fundamental unit here is not any particular role. It is a product team or an empowered product team 
So I think it might be great for you to tell us a little bit in your words, what it is to be a product team, because I think the lack of those is at the root of a lot of our problems. Yeah. But the reason that is a problem at startups and at large companies is usually because the leaders don't understand. So the real issue, honestly, is the leaders. Look at the leaders of companies that get this and the leaders that don't. I like to look at, remember, you know, Apple, Steve Jobs created a pretty amazing company. Then he was kicked out. Scully takes over, a marketing person, absolutely clueless about product. You know, it took him to near bankruptcy. Steve Jobs comes back, the product person becomes the most valuable company in the world. Look at what happened at Microsoft. Bill Gates built an amazing company. Bomber, a salesperson, almost killed it. <laughs> and now Satya comes back and look at how them coming back again. So I want to really highlight the role of the leader. And I explained to the founders, they are this leader. They are this leader. And they're either going to care about product or not. They're either going to hire the right people or not. They're going to either give them the room to work or not. If they're a classic, you know, being a little facetious here, but sort of there are, <laughs> no, I probably shouldn't go there, but um, Please do. there are a lot of, go there, Marty. There are a lot of leaders that think that they're paid the big bucks to have all the ideas and their ideas are going to be right. And they know that in our industry, only about 20% of ideas pay off, but they think they're not the norm. They think they're smarter than everybody else. And so they're like, just do what I say. And that usually will doom a startup. I'm mostly introduced to startups through the VC community. And if the founders are like that, I'm like, you know, there's little I can do. You're going to have to decide for yourself that that doesn't work. You know, I hope it does. That'd be great. I'm not going to bet on it. And then you have to hope that you figure out it doesn't work before you're out of money. There's a really interesting parallel here between the empowered product team concept and the concept of agile and, you know, the original agile manifesto. And in the same way, I think that the term MVP has been skewed. I think agile has been skewed in the same way. It feels like there's this very strong gravitational pull towards some sort of waterfall model, right? Where it's like, I have an idea, we'll sketch out the idea, then we'll implement the idea. And that is basically the pathway. And I think what both the agile manifesto and the concept of empowered product teams are trying to say is no, our biggest role in a startup or in a product team at a larger company is not to build the product. It is to discover what the product is, right? I'm a founder, I've got a startup. And we talk about the main role of a startup is to be a learning machine. And 90% of the work is to learn or to discover what the product is you should be building. And only then is that final piece of building the product and getting it out to market, the piece that people think of as the whole thing. It's only really that last 10%. I agree with where you're going there. The way I try to explain it is most of this, there's natural selection that goes on. Most startups that reach out to me, they genuinely want to set up and work like the best product companies. Otherwise, they wouldn't have called, right? So they want to do, but they don't know what does that entail. They've all heard the term agile. So they know like, what the hell, you know, does that matter? Is that a good thing? Is it important? You know, they're asking that. And I try to explain, look, fundamentally, what it means to be a real product company, a tech-powered product company, a product-led company, whatever term you like the best, it really means three things. The first is really where you were starting there. It's changing how you build product, just fundamentally how you build. That's what Agile does. And I'm not talking fake Agile, things like Safe and stuff like that. I'm talking real Agile, Scrum, Kanban, XP. But let me I put it this way, because many of the most Agile teams I know think Agile is a bunch of bullshit. And they don't use any of the rituals. They don't use any of the roles, but they do continuous deployment. Yeah. Well, this is the thing. Actually, the analogy there, Marty, is in the same way that people fundamentally misunderstand MVP and distort it towards waterfall, Agile has been systematically misunderstood and misapplied back towards waterfall in the same way. And, and as you say, the best teams tend not to use the terminology. They just do the thing. That's right. And they, don't, they understand the difference between a ritual and a principle, right? Agile, you know, they're following a process. And it's never about the process. So I try to get people not to focus on process. That's a real problem in a lot of parts of the world. And if you talk to the leaders of the best companies, they're scared to death of process infiltrating their company. Steve Jobs used to call it the disease of process people. It is a serious disease. It's often a fatal disease. So we don't want to go there. What we want to do is meaningfully look 
When I say change how you build, if you can't consistently build, test, and release at least once a week, at least, you should be doing that multiple times a day. But if you can't do that at least once a week, you don't have that muscle that you will need. So that's the first thing. And that's what Agile is talking about in the good sense. That's what it's talking about. But what you were getting at, the second thing is changing how you solve problems. Because Agile doesn't address how you solve problems. It only addresses how you build the solution. It doesn't address how you solve the problem. Changing how you solve problems, that's the difference of moving from command and control, top down. This is why all these, you know, a lot of people want to come back to Waterfall. It's very top down. They like that because Waterfall is actually, as bad as it is, it's pretty easy to be predictable. Very easy. And that predictability, a lot of senior executives will do pretty much anything for predictability, even if it gets them nothing in terms of outcomes. They love predictability. So they'll go with that. And what we need, of course, is skills to figure out the right solution. That's product discovery, coming up with a solution that's valuable, usable, feasible, and viable. That's product discovery. So that's the second big thing that startup needs to do. Third thing they need to do is get smart about what problems they decide to go after. Do they go after every little thing that the founder's scared about? That's what too many of them do, right? They have all these things. They see competitors, they lose deals, so they think they're missing features. They see threats coming from other places, so they think they've got to start a crypto product. There are all kinds of goofy things. And no, good product companies also are strong in how they decide which problems to go solve, which opportunities to pursue, and which threats to take seriously. There are product skills in all three of those things. How do you build? How do you solve problems? How do you decide what problems to solve? Those three skills, though, are what makes a good product company. I try to use that to give people the big picture view. This is what you need to do. And it should start to become clear, okay, the CEO, the founders have a very big role in that. So do your product managers, so do your designers, so do your engineers. They have a very big role in that. So interesting. I feel like our metaphors are wrong. And often when the metaphor is wrong, that leads to a lot of bad decision making. And you, know, you talked about building and just as you were talking, it was occurring to me that maybe that metaphor of building is part of the problem, right? You know, everyone's like, it's time to build and building this and building that. What that suggests is if you think about where does that metaphor lead? It's like I'm building a house or something. I design it. I get an architect. I get an engineer, all of that. And then I get the construction crew and they build the thing and I move into my house and happy days. Whereas you talk about product discovery. I wonder if there is an element that's more like mining or something like that, where the main activity is not the building, it's discovering what it is that you even should build. And that is a question of, you know, you use the term discovery of prospecting, of exploring, of learning. Yeah, I don't, I mean, we have to pick our battles. That's one I don't think we need to pick. Yeah. Um, I think building is a good metaphor. Even the construction is a decent metaphor for that because Look, your house that you're going to have happy days in is probably a little different than my house. I probably, I might have more dogs. You might have more kids. Well, all these kinds of things and different. So that architect, that designer, they're working with me to figure out what that blueprint ought to be. We're paying attention to the materials. We're paying attention to costs. We're paying attention to all that. And then we're going to build it. The build metaphor works fine for me. I think the bigger issue is just obviously... You don't want to build just anything. You want to build something that people really want and will choose. Every product team does discovery and delivery. That's just the two things we do all the time, every day. We figure out what to build, we build it. One of the reasons that build is sustained as a metaphor so long is most of the people on a product team are there to build. So they're not equal numbers, right? There's 10 engineers, one designer, one founder, or one product manager. That's it. So most of the people are building. I guess my point is that it suggests a linearity where we discover the solution and then we build it and then we're done. You don't iterate on your house very much. It's a very expensive thing to do. Because a house is hardware. Correct. And that's basically why we have the same problem if you're building an iPhone, right? You've got the same problem because once you've got the iPhone, you know, I can't bring that by Cupertino and ask them to, you know, fix it up for me. Doesn't happen. 
So you have a window and then manufacturing happens. That's why it's so important to do this prototyping before they send anything to manufacturing. So I'd love to turn the conversation a bit more to prototyping. Now you mentioned that Inspired is full of tips about that. What you're really talking about in Inspired is there's a toolkit for product managers to do solution discovery that is much broader than just let's tell the engineers what the software should do. And so I guess I'm interested in your experience and your thoughts on what the key skills and what the toolkit of a product manager should really look like. The first thing that's really important is that everything I'm just about to say, it only applies to empowered product teams because on a feature team, which is what most companies are doing, especially in my experience, most of them in Australia. But I want to be honest, even in San Francisco, you can be right across the street from a great product company and they can have feature teams. So they're everywhere. Feature teams are just there to implement the ideas of the stakeholders, which might be the founder, right? If that's how the founder thinks. So in a feature team, product managers do pretty much what you're describing, Yana. They say, all right, you know, the, the founder wants X. They want us to implement buy now, pay later on our e-commerce site. So they're saying, uh, okay, well, now we got to go figure out what that means. So we look at one of the sites, we choose one of the vendors and we write requirements. We put it in JIRA as a ticket. We ask the designer to design a workflow. We bring it to sprint planning and the engineers get to work. What I described, that is a feature team. There is no figure out how to get more conversion. There was just implement buy now, pay later, right? Now, if your product team is not set up as a feature team, if they're set up like an empowered product team, that is the product manager might have the same title, but they have a completely different job. I wish we could change the name. To me, the title of somebody on an empowered product team should be distinctly different than somebody on a feature team because the role is night and day different. You know, look, the truth is a product owner can do a feature team. A product manager is required, and this is where it even came from, from these empowered teams. And that's because, remember, we talked about with a solution, it's got to be valuable, usable, feasible, viable. There's no question the engineers are going to own at least feasible, and there's no question the designers are going to own at least usable. But the product manager, or in a startup, the founder is the one who owns value and viability. Will the customer actually buy it and will it work for our business? That is a very different job. They need very different skills. In fact, I don't talk about this much because it's a trigger phrase at this point. People don't even listen to me when I mention this. But when I first heard the saying, that in a good product team, the product manager is the CEO of the product. And that was from Ben Horowitz at Netscape Days. I knew what he meant because he said so. If you think about it, the product manager is responsible for value and viability. In a startup, the founder is responsible for value and viability. That's where it comes from. He wasn't saying that to imply that the product manager is the boss of anybody. They're not. It's a flat structure on a product team but they are responsible in value and viability. And that's why that term is there. Now, if it triggers so many people, I don't even bother going there. There's no purpose to going there. But I do say all the time that if you want to be a real product manager on a product team, you need to step up to value and viability. And that means bringing skills to your team that they desperately need. And if you don't have you're the wrong person for the job, right? You have to be an expert in your customers. You have to be an expert in the data. You have to be an expert in the industry. And you have to be an expert in how your company works. Otherwise, you're not able to bring that to your team. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm definitely triggered by the <laughs> PM is the CEO of the product team. My background is as an engineer. And the reason I'm triggered by it is because of how I've seen it used, which is it's probably based on a misunderstanding of what the CEO's job actually is, right? Which is CEO is often used as a metaphor for boss. And so when the PM says to the rest of the team, I'm the CEO of the product team, they're saying, I'm in charge of this team. You have to listen to me. And so the triggering isn't perhaps, you know, a common theme so far with what we've been talking about is actually the semantic drift of useful terminology to effectively become toxic over time. No, I think it's true. And it's sad too, because I know that when that was first said to me, I was working in a company where we basically adored our CEO. His name was Jim Barksdale at Netscape. He was, I still think he was one of the best leaders I've ever met. 
And so to me, when you say CEO, it means actually pretty damn good thing. It's like, I don't know if I could ever be that good, but I've met other companies. You have to realize the context was different when it came. And I still think in good product companies, they don't have that you know, connotation, but it's not worth triggering people, except when I want to poke at them, then it's kind of fun. <laughs> yeah, I think the difference in the job title you talked about is the person you described on a feature team is essentially a project manager. That's right. They're not a product manager. That's right. And yeah. I've actually yeah, written posts myself about, are you a product manager or a project manager? And it is about connecting with that value and that viability. What I focus in on is it's about developing principled opinions about what your product strategy, your product roadmap, your product tactics are versus just shuffling requests from one side and routing them into engineering on the other side. It's about doing the hard work of developing an opinion through data, through testing, through what have you, yeah. uh, and really owning your part of the business, your part of the product. Yeah. Informed opinions is what I'd probably call it. Yes. More than principled, it's informed. In other words, I tell product managers all the time, if you're not willing to do the homework, you've got no business being a product manager because there's a lot of work to be done. Right. Yeah. When I use principle, I think of grounded in information and data and a set of principles about what you're trying to build and the business model that you're going after and so on. So it's kind of this ball of all of the things that you're trying to achieve with the product and the strategy. I mentioned this earlier, Marty. Product management and design, and you mentioned the designer owns usability in a sense, and the product manager owns value and viability. That relationship is one that I think within an empowered product team is particularly challenging. I think there is a very common pattern where the designer's main job is to kind of take requirements and make it look nice, or maybe even to a certain extent, design the information architecture and things like that. The interaction design, but even interaction design doesn't seem to go to the very heart of what a product designer should be responsible for in a truly empowered team. We talked before about the difference in a product manager from a feature team to an empowered team. Now you're highlighting the difference of a designer in a feature team versus an empowered product team. In a feature team, they have to do some interaction design for sure. They have to apply the visual design. They might do a usability test, but the point is they're just there to implement the solution someone else came up with. On the other hand, in an empowered product team, a designer is there to actually help come up with the right experience, the whole solution. Like Steve Dobbs said, how the whole product works. And that is a much bigger job. The other thing I really should say is I try never to talk about just product manager and design because the third part of that is probably the most important of all, which is engineering. In that we could talk about engineers on a feature team. They're just there to code, right? They're just there to code. They're mercenaries. In fact, that's why a lot of companies outsource engineering to places like Accenture or wherever. Instead, in an empowered product team, the engineers need to care just as much about what they build as how they build it. As a startup founder, you cannot let yourself get distracted with the everyday admin of running a company. That's where today's sponsored Deal comes in. Deal's all-in-one HR platform does all the work of running a global team for you, so you can focus on changing the world. Go to deal.com slash TSP to learn more. So the three legs of the stool are really product design and engineering. And those three have got to be side by side at inception of those ideas. Otherwise, you don't get innovation. The innovation happens more often than not from the engineers because they are working with the enabling technology. So one of the anti-patterns that's so common, even by the way, in good product organizations, this is a common anti-pattern, is the engineers are just so busy building that the engineers and designers get too tempted to go off on their own. And then they come back after a week with these amazing prototypes that everybody is so excited about. And the engineers are like, well, that's not good. And we're going to have to do damage control and unwind this stuff. They didn't know about the tech debt implications of this. They didn't know about the technology implications of this. So you really don't want to have a conversation about product without product design engineering, the three skill sets. They are really different skill sets. They all bring different things to the table. Every once in a while, I meet somebody that knows two of those, and they're awesome. Very occasionally, I can list literally on one hand the people I know that I call triple threats. They are awesome at all three. 
But man, we're talking unicorns now. Those are really rare beasts. But oh my God, are they great. So Mario, I'm going to say something or I'm going to, I want to push back on this and be the devil's advocate. I'm going to get both of you to gang up on me. <laughs> Yanev is already rubbing his hands here. So I have seen more often than not, not a lack of engineering consideration from product managers where they are missing some trick about technical debt or technical feasibility, but rather I've seen the opposite where their ideas come pre-compromised because of something they assume engineering can't do, or more often than not, because something engineering said, well, that's a bit difficult. We can do it this other different, easier way. And so I have somewhat of an engineering background, or at least a very technical background. I have somewhat of a design background and I have a product background. So I do have the kind of unfair advantage of those three things. But oftentimes what I spend a lot of time doing with product managers is helping them to uncompromise their idea about what the ideal user experience or product definition is and encouraging them to have an opinion up front before allowing engineering or other limitations, regulation, operations, and so on to compromise their vision for the ideal product. Yeah. I mean, first of all, you're actually not saying that different a thing because I was complaining about product not including engineering. In your model, product is not including engineering. <laughs> and so we're talking about that problem. You really want to make sure they are including, that doesn't mean product doesn't bring a strong pro point of view. It does mean though, if you are an engineer that is just brought in to build, you're basically only asked one question. How long will it take to build this? You're not being asked, should we build this? In fact, one of the characteristics of my favorite product teams is just because a product manager puts something on the backlog, it doesn't mean they build it. They don't. At a good product company, the engineers have all the right to say, this makes no sense. Why would we build this? I've never met a customer that needs this. I don't see the data. I don't see the evidence. Show me. Now, I tell, pro you know, not every product manager likes that. <laughs> Most of them don't. But I tell them, look, if that happens, there's two possibilities. Both of them are important. One possibility is you're right as a product manager. You should do that. But you have not included your engineers early enough. You did not bring them to the customers. You did not show them the data. They're not convinced. You do not want them to be a mercenary. You want them to believe in what you're trying to do. So that's one screw up and that's on you as product manager. The other screw up is maybe they're right. There is a much better way to do this and you're not listening. So either way, <laughs> that is good that they stop that either way. So I think, in fact, I wrote an article called literally the most important thing. It's one of the last chapters in the book Empowered, because I think it is of all the things we talk about, it's the most important thing to take away is this notion of a truly empowered engineer. Literally, Bill Campbell told that to Steve Jobs. He told that to Bezos. He told that to Larry and Sergi. Nothing is more important than an empowered engineer. And just to be clear, an empowered engineer is a very clear definition. They are somebody that's empowered to come up with the solution, not just the implementation. I agree with that. And as an engineer myself, one of my key career moments, I guess, the sort of moments of clarity was when I was at Google and they introduced a new job ladder, a new way of effectively measuring your performance. And for the first time for engineers, they basically said your performance is going to be evaluated on the difficulty of the work you're doing, on your leadership and on the impact of your work. And I was initially outraged as an engineer that I would be measured on the impact of my work because I was like, my job is to build the thing I'm told to build. It's not my fault if it has no impact. But I was relatively early in my career then. I spoke to some more senior folks and they really turned around my thinking. And I realized that what I was being given was permission or even more than permission, having an expectation set that as an engineer, I can't just be in charge of implementation because if I'm being asked to implement something that I think is a bad use of my time, then my performance is going to be negatively affected in terms of how it's judged. And so I became much more vocal, much more empowered, I guess, by that simple act in terms of incentive systems, right? But also just the clarity of it. I'm saying, well, okay, I'm an engineer. I'm responsible for impact. Therefore, I cannot just do what the product manager tells me if I don't think it's going to lead to impact. I have a voice in that. And an obligation, an obligation. An obligation, a duty. In those 
career ladders, there's a point where, because as a very early engineer, mostly you're just asked to build what you're told to build. And, you know, you're learning the craft of software engineering. But there is a point on that ladder where you now are responsible just as much for impact as you are for execution. And that we usually call that the tech lead. That is a tipping point in your career. And if you want to become a very senior engineer, you're signing up for that. I was told that. Thousands of engineers are told that. And that, I think that's key. It's true that way in all the best companies I know. There's a reason you're every engineer's favorite product thinker because you put the engineering really at the center of things there. Engineers tend to respond very well to clearly articulated incentives and models, right? So again, if you say to an engineer, it's your job to push back on product management or rather to work with product management, they will tend to do so. Where I've seen it more challenging is to get truly empowered product designers, product designers who care about impact, who care about the commercial side, the feasibility side of the designs that they're producing and have a more active voice rather than kind of, yes, creating a design to a spec. First of all, we have to acknowledge that there are differences regionally around the world around this. That said, you're describing graphic designers. I could introduce you to a hundred designers and they would all tell you nonsense. What you just said is nonsense. A product designer, they are trained to come up with the real solutions and they hate companies where all they're asked to do is put lipstick on a pig is the phrase, right? They hate that. Now, a graphic designer, that is what they're paid to do. <laughs> they're paid to make it pretty. It's look and feel. That's it. A product designer a true interaction designer, a UX designer, goes by lots of different terms, service designer. These people are paid to solve problems for customers. In my observation around the world is, no, we have almost the opposite problem. Good designers that have been trained how to work on an empowered product team find themselves working on a feature team and are asking themselves, they're often asking me, is this why I studied design? to build a bunch of crappy features from some dumb stakeholders that have no idea what the customer situation really is. Cause I don't really excited about that more than anything else. I'm asked by designers. Can you introduce me to this company? <laughs> because they want to go to a company that really values designers. To be honest, John, 20 years ago, we had a real shortage of product designers. We had plenty of graphic designers because, you know, they're used for marketing, they're used for advertising. But realistically, and this is going to sound very crass, a product designer is paid two to three times what a graphic designer is paid, sometimes more. So what that created was a lot of graphic designers trying to pitch themselves as product designers. So there was that going on too. But today, honestly, I work with teams in Europe. I work with teams in Asia. I work with teams in Australia too and New Zealand. Design is, I don't think it's as bad as you're seeing. I think you might've had, I hope you've had a bad sample. It's funny, what we're really talking about across all of these empowered roles, right, is the ability to say no and to ask for evidence or to contribute to good decisions for the product team. I was watching this video of Elon Musk giving a guided tour of SpaceX to the everyday astronaut on YouTube. And I want to find the list of things he went through, but he talked about his process for admitting things into their products, their rocket ships or their cars. And one of the first things was just reject dumb requirements, just eliminate them from the process. And that was one of the first steps and a lot of what you've said, Marty, is engineers being able to reject dumb requirements, dumb feature requests, designers being able to reject them, and product managers being able to reject them from the business. Right. And each of them adding value along a collaborative process so that the best ideas win and the ultimate outcome is a synthesis of everyone's best thinking. Yeah, this is the start of a really good topic. It might be one that your audience is less interested in, but I will say... So what Elon was talking to is a really important difference. If you look at what has he done, he's disrupted the auto industry. He's disrupted the aerospace industry. And how does he do that? Because he is a master at untangling domain expertise from domain dogma. Yes. In every industry, there is domain dogma. There are people that tell you, like you go into Ford or you go into Boeing, they'll tell you, you can't do this. You can't do over the air updates. You can't do, you know, they'll say you can't do that because they think you can't. And of course he does know if you actually look closely, there's nothing that says you can't do this. 
yeah, it's one of the first things we talked about in this episode, which is that new technologies, new cultural norms and new business models undo domain dogma. And Elon Musk is very, very good at, you know, first principles thinking right. to throw out all of the assumptions, the sacred cows. I love your term of domain dogma. And I often will tell founders and ostensibly domain experts who have exited some domain building or healthcare or what have you, and they've gone to build a startup because they saw a problem. I'll often remind them actually that they have been so indoctrinated in the domain, in the dogma, in the industry practices that it's sometimes hard for them to take a step back and rethink from first principles when thinking through the product or business that they're building. And so that's why oftentimes a good product manager should come maybe from outside of the domain and ask dumb fundamental questions about why are we doing things this way? Yeah. Uh, and I've never heard anyone better than Elon Musk articulate this first principles. I think he calls it physics thinking. He thinks of it as kind of a scientific physics process. Yeah. Uh, and he applies that to business and product. I just want to give credit here. I got the term domain dogma from one of my favorite product thinkers. His name is Shriyas Doshi. Yeah, and he's the one who framed it that way. And I really resonated with that. I've been writing about the problem of product managers that come from the domain forever. I think my first article was nearly 20 years ago about that. It's a real problem. In general, we would much rather take a great product person and teach them a new domain than take somebody from the domain and teach them the art of product. So, so I'm with you. I said that exact same thing to a startup I advise in the healthcare space. I said, we do not need someone from healthcare. We need an incredible product manager. In fact, it's better that they're not from healthcare because the system is broken. We need to three things. You know what? And since you said that, Chris, because I think this is going to apply to a lot of the people who listen. Because when you do a startup, your customers are often these big healthcare companies, these big insurance companies, these big banks. The last thing you want to do is start working like them. And the last thing you want to do is adopt the position that we're all taught in the water through osmosis is the customer is always right. And oftentimes the customer is just fundamentally wrong. They don't understand product. They don't understand scale. They would very happily treat you like a technology vendor or an agency to have you solve all of their problems that they've ever encountered. And it takes an enormous amount of product discipline to hear the pain from the customer, but filter that through, as I said earlier, principles and good judicious intuition, analysis, experimentation, and strategy to come up with an actual focused product solution to just the piece you want to tackle, not everything your customer is asking for. Yeah, this is referred to literally as the first principle of tech-powered product. And that we don't frame it as they're wrong so much. We frame it as customers don't know what's possible. They don't know what's possible. They're hiring you to do a job, which is to provide them a great solution. They are essentially trusting that you know what's possible. That's why one of my favorite quotes, all of the leaders have it, but Steve Jobs used to hold up his iPhone and say, you can conduct a hundred focus groups. You will never get an iPhone. Yes. Or Jeff Bezos would tell his product teams, I can't tell you what to build. Our customers can't tell you what to build. Your job is to invent on behalf of our customers. Yes. You know, they're all saying the same thing. And this is the perpetual discomfort that I have when I talk to product managers. But even listening to this and participating in this conversation today, I hear the truth of everything that we've been saying. And I understand how, if applied correctly, it works out very well. But the problem that I encounter more often is not insufficient experimentation or insufficient learning and iteration. I find it's a lack of intuition and principled decision making. That's the problem I find more, more often than not, is to take a step back and take a look at the world and have some intuition about what might be the right answer before blindly stumbling into endless experimentation, iteration and experimentation and discovery. I understand there's a relationship between those two things, and there's a tight relationship between those two things. And that's how you design good experiments, good iteration, and so on. But I find people skip that first step, and they, they just jump to the, the blank paper experimentation step. This is a pretty big point. I personally resist the whole talk of intuition, because to me, it's a cop-out. It makes people think, oh, you either have good product sense or you don't. You're born with it or you're not, which is just complete and utter bullshit. It's not like that. You can develop this intuition in people. And the one biggest concept that we have not talked about yet, that really everything we have talked about is predicated on, 
how the hell do your product managers, designers, and engineers learn to work like this? How do they learn good judgment? How do they learn good product sense? Coaching. This is how almost everybody who does it well learned. This is how Shriyas learned it. This is how I learned it. This is how everybody good learned it from somebody. Even Steve Jobs was coached literally for more than a decade by Bill Campbell. I mean, so even at that level, for example, the person who was coaching me on product told me point blank that I was not allowed to make a single decision for the product team until after I visited 30 customers. He said, I don't know what you're going to learn. All I know is that it'll rock your world. And sure enough, it did. I had all of these assumptions about our customers that were way off. And the irony here is I was building products for developers and I was a developer. <laughs> so I thought that was by one advantage. But no, turns out developers in most companies, like I remember visiting Walmart, visiting, you know, the engineers at FedEx, these companies and realizing, oh my God, they're nothing like the developers I work with. Totally different equipment, totally different education, totally different languages. All these things were different. And you learn. And after 30 visits, you would have said, oh, Marty has good product intuition. <laughs> the difference was I was clueless three weeks before. Right. What had happened was I was coached. I was also coached on the analytics. I was also coached on go to market. There were all these things I didn't know. So I just always, that's one of the trigger words for me. I don't want anybody to think you're either born with this or you're not. The truth is where you're lucky is do you work for somebody who knows what he's talking about or not? If you're lucky enough to work for someone that's been there, done that at a good product company that can coach you, you're incredibly lucky. That's what I try to tell people to look for. Yeah. So if your organization just doesn't work that way, if it doesn't have empowered product teams, what should you be doing? What is your advice? Buy lots of copies of Marty's book and hand it out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, ironically, I often do suggest that you get a book for the CEO. My books are not really aimed at the CEO. A good number of them have read it and reached out, but it's really aimed at the product leaders for Empowered and the product teams for Inspired. But I recommend like Tony Fidel's book, Build. I'd say like literally get a copy of that book, give it to your CEO. Now, first of all, I try to convince the person, don't leave yet. You could always leave, right? You can always go to another company that you believe does this much better. But before you leave, I like to give the company a chance. And I like to say, look, how about if we do an experiment? Let's just, for our team, let us try working like this for a quarter or two. What do you think? It's a low-risk experiment. If it doesn't work better than what we do now, we just go back to what we do now. If it works better, maybe other teams will want to work that way. Most companies are more than willing to do a low-risk experiment like that. Now, it does mean that I tell the people, and you can start preparing yourself and your team today for that. You can start saying, you know, look, you're going to have to move from product manager really as a project manager to product manager is really a product manager. <laughs> so you can start doing your homework. You can start visiting your customers. You can start learning the dimensions of your business. You can start learning the analytics. Start doing that. It can only help your career. It can only help. And hopefully your company will give you that chance. Now, if they just say, sorry, we like the way things work. You know, if it's not broke, don't fix it. They may not think it's broke. One of the hardest things is to get a company that is doing well to change. And as you know, if they don't have a lot of competition or if they have government protection like big banks often do or insurance companies, they have very little motivation to change. So they might say not interested. I very much like what you said towards the beginning of this episode where you said the downturn is uncovering this inefficiency now and you can no longer hide behind easy capital raising. And so if you're going to make a change in your company, now is the time. There is no better time to try to drive that efficiency within the business and efficiency of outcomes for the business because there's no room to raise easy, cheap capital or to survive the downturn without getting better at what you do. I think that's right, Chris, but I think what Marty's saying, what I've seen and actually is one of my bigger frustrations about the ecosystem in Australia is this is the companies that are actually very successful. You know, they're already unicorns are publicly listed with a, you know, billion dollar plus valuation. And because of various aspects to do with the market that they're in or competition or just entrenchment, 
they are successful and perhaps they become a regional player, right? They might be the biggest something in Oceania and Southeast Asia, but they had the opportunity to be the global leader. It's hard to say, oh, you know, you're a $2 billion company. You have failed in some sense because you should have been a $30 billion company, but your lack of rigorous product thinking and product empowerment has thwarted your growth. There is an amazing interview you can find online that was uncovered recently called The Lost Interview. Have you heard of this? I've heard of it from you recently, yes. <laughs> yeah, The Lost Interview. It was recorded in 1995 with Steve Jobs, a year after he had been kicked out of his own company. And he did a very rare interview because he normally he loved to talk about his products and stuff, but he did a, an interview on how to do great product. And this interview was actually done for a public television thing. They used seven minutes of it. And then the actual recording was lost. And then he died, of course, recently, relatively recently. And after that, one of the producers found a copy of that recording in his garage and he just shared it online. But it's an hour unedited interview on how to do great product. And it blew my mind. He speaks to this issue. How do you get these companies that are so bad at product yet make so much money? And he says, what happens is at one point they had to have done something useful for customers, right? Of course. But then they get to a level, they kind of own their space. Like you said, they're the regional leader in finance for Australia. Okay. Not a lot of competition anymore. So what happens? It becomes all about sales and marketing and finance. That's how you grow. Marketing. That's how you grow. Cut costs. So what happens? Those are the people that get promoted. And pretty soon, that's who's running your company. Do you think product people want to work in those kind of companies? Not really. They leave. They go to the companies like Stripe that are trying to disrupt all of those players right now and having remarkable success. And he said that's what leads to the decline of so many companies. They forget that it's all about product and providing that value every day to your customers. They forget that. And that is what you see out there all the time. That made total sense to me. So one final question, nearly from the other side here. If you are a leader and maybe you're at the stage where you're looking to hire a product manager or product managers, we talked before about dogma and we talked before about how a lot of product managers are not really product managers, they're product owners. They may have learned a lot of bad habits at a previous job about what it is to be a product manager. And so I'm curious, when you're looking to hire PMs, what sort of profile do you look for? Is it important that they had a product management role in their background? How do you evaluate whether they have been a, a real product manager or a someone who calls themselves a product manager, but is in fact something else? Yeah. Well, it turns out that that's actually easy if you've considered the most important thing, which you haven't mentioned, which is who is the hiring manager? If the hiring manager has been there, done that with product, and obviously if you're a vice president of product or a director of product management, that's what you're supposed to be, right? That's why you were promoted is the theory. <laughs> and so if you know what you're doing, then that's easy. First of all, it's easy to interview, but you also, whether you hire, you have a choice. Do you hire like Netflix likes to hire people with a lot of experience? Or do you like to hire like Google, hire a lot from universities and mold them into the kind of product manager you want? Either way works great. I personally think the hiring people based on potential and developing them is more scalable. If you see what Netflix pays for people, you realize how expensive it is to have the model they have, but it's a good model. It's just a very expensive model. Anyway, you would hire based on your ability to develop your people. The worst thing is somebody who doesn't know what to look for. And so now what do they do? They, oh, this person had a certified scrum product owner certification. That must mean they know something. They don't know anything. You know, that's what happens. So they bring them in and they say, well, they're certified. We should have a product manager here. And they're just getting a deep hole. So in that case, if you are a manager that doesn't know, now hopefully you're aware enough to know you don't know, but if you don't know what to look for, then you need to get some help. That's what product leadership coaches do. I know a bunch of product leadership coaches all over the world, and I introduce people to them. I say, look, this person can help you. They can help you learn the skills as a product leader. Your CEO almost certainly promoted you because they believe in your potential. 
But since you've never been there and done that, you're going to need some help. So you're going to need help on recruiting. You're going to need help on coaching. You're going to need help on product vision. You're definitely going to need help on product strategy. That's what a product leadership coach can do. But one way or another, unless you fix that, your issue is not your hiring. Your issue is your manager. That's a really good way of putting it. And it speaks to your point earlier on that your first product manager or your first person in charge of product needs to be the founder or someone in the leadership team. And I think so many things at any company, you have to have things right at the top for anything else to work. So that first product leader, yeah. I'll mention because you have so many startup founders that are interested in listening to your podcast, the best VCs I know. They only invest if at least one of the co-founders is a proven product person because they know how important this is. So they usually, as you know, like two <laughs> founders, not just one, but they want to make sure that one of them knows product. Otherwise, it's the blind leading the blind, right? So that wouldn't be good. They want to make sure that that's the case. So I would encourage if you're a founder or want to be a founder, find a co-founder that's good at product, team up with. Just wondering if there is any final thoughts or hot take you'd like to leave our audience with before we wrap up. I mean, we were all over the place this last hour, so there's quite a bit. Hopefully people consider it useful. Absolutely. I think they will very much. I think we've covered a lot of important topics that we've touched lightly in previous episodes and you've done an incredible job of going deep and articulating and describing it so well. Thank you very much for your time, Marty. Well, thanks for inviting me. A lot of people ask us when we talk about subjects like this, wow, this is really intense stuff. It's stuff that I really resonate with. How in the world can I get you guys to help me with this? Because this is like stuff I need to fix in my startup. So, you know, how can people work with you directly? You know, I have my own startup, Circular. And if you have a small bite-sized nugget of work where you think I could make a big difference in a small time, I'm always happy to talk about how I can help with that. How about you, Chris? If you'd like to work with me, I have carved out some time to work with startups and I do have actually two slots in Q4. So drop me a line. You can find out more at chrissard.com slash advisory or follow me on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and all of the fun social media. And I also share a lot of content like this podcast for free. And the last thing we'll ask is if you love the podcast and if you love your fellow founders and want to bring joy and momentum into the world, we'd really like to ask you to go back into the back catalog and find your favorite episode of the Startup Podcast and share it with your network on Facebook, on LinkedIn, on Instagram, on TikTok. Choose your favorite social media platform. Choose your favorite episode of the Startup Podcast and share it with your friends. It would really mean a lot to us. It would help your friends and followers discover the podcast and ultimately gives Yanev and I a little bit more motivation to keep recording these things. It takes a lot of effort and a lot of time and it would really make our day. 100%. Sharing with others is a really important part of how we build what we are building. Catch you in the next one. Thanks, Chris. See you later. We all know how expensive software engineers are, and that's why it makes sense to give them the best tools to be as productive as possible. At Google, there was an entire division devoted to developer tooling and developer productivity. Now with SourceGraph, you can give your engineers the same superpowers that Google software engineers get. SourceGraph is a code intelligence platform that provides tools like code search, advanced analytics, and bulk refactoring. Check them out at sourcegraph.com slash the startup podcast. Today's episode of the startup podcast was brought to you by Deal, the all-in-one HR platform for global teams. Deal are growing incredibly fast, and that's because of the amazing flexibility they provide. Go to deal.com slash TSP, that's D-E-E-L dot com slash TSP for the startup podcast to learn more.